January, 1802, Le Cap. 20,000 French soldiers arrive off the coast of Saint-Dumas. For months, Toussaint Louverture has sent letters to Napoleon, telling him that the only way for Saint-Dumas to stay a part of France is home rule, a system where slavery can never return. Toussaint has not broken the colony from France, he argues. He has saved it. Napoleon feels differently. He has sent this force under the command of his brother-in-law, Charles Leclerc, with orders to subjugate the island and arrest Toussaint, because he fundamentally believes Toussaint's government should not exist. My decision to destroy the authority of the blacks in Saint-Dumain, Napoleon said, is not so much based on consideration of commerce and money as on the need to block forever the march of blacks in the world. And in that endeavor, he will fail. Toussaint Louverture's Constitution of 1801 was a landmark in world history. Not only did it state that slavery would never be allowed in Saint-Dumain, it made Haiti the first nation in the world whose constitution forbade discrimination on the basis of race and skin color. It's an incredible document, and many nations will spend a century and a half catching up to those same ideals. But it also effectively gave the colony home rule. And not only did this, let's just say, upset France, it also made Toussaint's allies reconsider supporting him. The British were briefly at peace with France and no longer wanted to rock the boat. And the new president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, was a staunchly pro-French slave owner. He was not going to support a government formed via slave revolt. In fact, both nations were so concerned that the revolution might spread to their own slave systems that they began turning away refugees that might even carry news of it. There was an idea developing that this troublesome island that had proven slave insurrection could not only win, but then fight off incursions by multiple European armies would set a bad precedent if it succeeded. Besides, the country's sugar infrastructure had been so damaged by the years of fighting that the main economic argument that independence was good for foreign trade no longer held water. 15% of saint Dumont's workforce had left the plantations to join rebel or foreign armies. Factory workers and cities had been repeatedly damaged. And then Leclerc arrived. Originally, his orders were to negotiate a peaceful solution. But that went out the window when one of his commanders attacked a fort due to a miscommunication. Now it was war. Toussaint's defensive plan was to withdraw into the mountainous interior for a guerrilla war, torching the cities so the French had no base of operations. Experience taught him that these new arrivals would suffer badly from disease, and that would be his advantage. But two months before Leclerc arrived, Toussaint was forced to put down a rebellion, led by his adopted nephew, who had never been fully on board with the forced labor program. Soon, Leclerc secured the Santo Domingo side. Had Toussaint been able to marshal a united island, he would have won outright. But the recent civil strife and garbled communications meant that many did not rally to his banner. Even so, initial battles stunned both sides with their ferocity. Toussaint decided against raising the cities, but one of his commanders did put Le Cap to the torch before withdrawing. Both sides were in bad shape. Yellow fever swept through the French ranks, and the guerrilla campaign caused heavy casualties. So five months into the war, when Leclerc offered peace, in exchange for Toussaint retiring to his plantation with full honors, Toussaint decided that it was his best option. He could not continue. It was there the French troops arrested him. Instead of treating him like an officer of rank, they bundled him along like a prisoner, musket at his back, putting him on a ship and deporting him to France. In overthrowing me, you have cut down in Saint-Dumont only the trunk of the Tree of Liberty, Toussaint warned during the arrest. It will spring up again from the roots, for they are numerous and they are deep. He would die less than a year later malnourished and ill in a mountain castle. But his words proved prophetic. Leclerc had taken nominal control, having brought with him André Rigaud and other exiles that had fled Toussaint, and had mostly convinced the population that France did not intend to bring back slavery. But then, yeah, France brought back slavery in nearby Guadalupe, and residents of saint Dumont knew it was only a matter of time before it happened to them. This was the universal call to arms Toussaint could not raise. No one wanted slavery back. Local officers that had supported Leclerc defected, and one group massacred several hundred Polish troops who were part of the French expedition. So, Leclerc decided on a new tactic, utter brutality. He wrote to Napoleon, saying that he would exterminate the rebels in the mountain areas, sparing only children under age 12. He would execute all black military officers. French soldiers shot and bayoneted prisoners by the hundreds. He executed a thousand people by tying weights around their necks and throwing them off ships. And Jacques Dessalines, now in nominal control of local forces, responded in kind. 
The violence of the conflict only escalated further when Leclerc himself died of yellow fever, leaving in charge an even more brutal subordinate who imported man-eating dogs to deal with the rebels. But this only galvanized the black and colored armies to finally form a united force. A year later, a year where Dessalines handed the French defeat after defeat, both sides gathered for what would be a decisive battle. The French held a hill fort, and General Francois Capois, a man who had risen up the ranks to become a general, and was known as Capois the Death, sounded the charge. French cannons tore into their ranks. Capois and his soldiers clambered over the casualties, regrouping when broken, reforming and pushing on. On the fourth assault, Capois tumbled to earth, his horse mutilated by a cannonball. He rose, and a bullet snatched away his hat. Then he drew his sword, and ran in front of his men, yelling, Forward! Forward! The display was so incredible, the French stopped firing and applauded his bravery. A French officer rode forward to carry the general's compliments. After this weird little aside, then the fighting resumed. Rebel generals, serving in the front line, were wounded. Shots tore away pieces of their uniforms. Still, they attacked. Then, the revolution ended as it began, with a storm. Lightning rent the air, and water poured down. The French withdrew, their position untenable. They sent a peace envoy the next day to negotiate their withdrawal from the island. Of the 80,000 French troops sent to saint dumont only 30,000 would return. In fact, their withdrawal was part of a general French pullback from the Americas. The vast expenditures of blood and treasure in saint dumont convinced Napoleon to cut his losses and focus on his European wars. To help that pursuit, he sold Louisiana to the United States. Dessalines was supposed to send the French wounded back to France after Leclerc's withdrawal. He drowned them instead. Because Dessalines had learned something from all of those years of indecision around slavery. With its wild reversals over civil rights and abolition, with French citizens like the Big Whites constantly trying to undermine and reverse every freedom won, the French had sent a message over the past decade that the people of saint dumont would never be safe under the rule of white Frenchmen. So, after declaring the island to be the independent nation of Haiti, Dessalines ordered all remaining white French should be massacred even the women and children. The people were reluctant, and often only complied when Dessalines showed up with an army to enforce the edict. Some French escaped, pretending to be Americans or British, who were not subject to the decree. But the message Dessalines intended to send backfired. It further isolated Haiti, with the United States refusing to recognize its government or trade with it for 60 years. Dessalines' military rule and crowning himself emperor continued to set the new nation on a troubled path. Generals would seize power regularly, ensuring the new nation could never fully recover from the damage of the revolution. Slaveholding societies like the United States looked at Haiti as a nightmare scenario, using it to argue incorrectly that wholesale slaughter was the inevitable result of abolition and that a black nation could not govern itself. Later, the French returned, forcing the Haitian government into massive indemnity payments it couldn't afford, burdening the already broken economy, keeping it in poverty. And due to this political instability, the United States would stage multiple military interventions in the 19th and 20th centuries under the banner of protecting American lives and property, eventually occupying the nation for 19 years. Others saw a different message, one of inspiration, not fear. When American firebrand John Brown tried to raise a slave revolt in the South before the Civil War, he'd hoped to trigger an uprising like Hades. And the new nation would both harbor the revolutionary Simon Bolivar when he was a fugitive and loan him Haitian troops on the condition that he freed the slaves in Spanish America. To the oppressed and colonized around the world, Haiti would become a symbol, one that showed what was possible when people, despite having nothing but determination and a desire for freedom, declared they would be slaves no more. Special thanks to our educational tier patrons Ahmed Ziad Turk, Joseph Blaine, and Dominic Valenciana. 